Hey there, friends. So glad you are here with us this week for my chat with Elena Muratova. After she retired from worldwide and Olympic competition as a mogul skier, she had to decide what came next. You're going to hear about her own path to clarity and purpose, and now how she helps other women find the way to redefine themselves in the course of transition. I know you're going to get so much out of this conversation. So glad you joined us. Hey there, friends. Are you looking for tools to resolve stress, reliable information to support your whole health, tips to help you motivate yourself? and identify when motivation is fading before it happens, implementation, accountability, and someone to remind you to celebrate even the small successes, where you could find tools you can use and accountability in a community that cheers you on, where information about health trends and lifestyle is reliable and straightforward. I know that you have what it takes to up-level your health habits and restore your resilience. You just might need a boost to start building momentum. I've designed a membership where you can choose the level of support you'd like to get every month, whether it's tuning in to connect with like-minded change makers or getting personalized support with one-on-one -on -one coaching to help you chart your path to success. Check out the link for the Velocity membership at happifiedlife.com. Special pre-launch pricing is now available for premium support, but you can jump in for free. If you just want to test the waters, I look forward to seeing you inside. Living in a stressful world doesn't mean you have to give up on happiness. Instead, you can shift your perspective of stress and discover how to live your life in flow. Welcome to Happified. I'm your host, Susie Vine. Join me for inspiration and interviews with folks who are shining their light in the world in the areas of positive mindset, health, and wellness. I'm so happy to have you here. Welcome back. I am so happy to have you with me this week for a conversation with a very special guest. And I know you're going to enjoy the insights and revelations that we're going to explore with Elena Muratova. She is an Olympian and an expert in wellness and life transitions. She spent almost 25 years in professional sports, taking podiums at the European Cup and World Cup competitions in mogul skiing. The pinnacle of Elena's athletic career was the participation in the 2014 Olympic Games. The same year, Elena retired from professional sports, moved from Russia to Canada, and started a new career. In 2019, she published her best-selling book, My Russian Way to Boldness, How to Find Yourself, in which she describes her journey from anxiety and traumas to resilience and confidence. She also shares how facing alopecia, a disease that causes hair loss, led to her body and self-acceptance. Elena is now a life transition coach and wellness specialist. Elena, thank you so much for making time to join us. Happy to have you with us. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be here today. What inspired, well, first, let me ask, what inspired this big move from Russia over to Canada and then this new path forward? Ah, I guess in short, it will be love. <laughs> it's a yeah. powerful force. It's a powerful force. It's difficult to resist and not to follow this force. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've been a professional athlete for many years and we had Canadian coaches uh, for maybe four or five years before Olympic Games in Sochi. So we spent some time in Canada and one of my during one of my training camps, I just met my husband here in Canada. And then when I retired from sports in 2014, I just came here right away almost one month after I retired, probably even earlier. <laughs> <laughs> so very early on, you were probably still, um, I would imagine, taking a well-earned vacation after retiring, taking that month to just relax and catch up on life. Yeah, I, I don't think I had this time 
actually. I needed to prepare to my wedding. <laughs> We we met in 2013 with my husband in the in the middle of the year, and of course our relationship was mostly a long distance relationship. Um, we met of course a few times <laughs> after our initial meeting and time together, but then when I uh, finished my sports career, I just was preparing to my wedding because my husband asked me to marry him, and I came to Canada. Like we had Olympic Games in February, and then I came to Canada in April with my wedding dress in in, in one hand and you know wedding shoes in the other hand. That's all. <laughs> Ready for the next chapter to begin. Yeah, I was very excited about the new next chapter, but I didn't know what to expect. To be honest. Yes. Well, to suddenly have all of that time to yourself, you know, and kind of looking at a blank page, where did you think you would be going or, or what did you think you would be doing next after being so involved in sports for your whole life? Yeah, it's a good question. It, um, initially, I had this honeymoon stage. I think I was excited and looking forward, you know, I just want to, I was tired from skis, didn't want to even <laughs> look at my ski for a while. And because of all this uh, stressful year with Olympic games and um, many emotional pressure. Yeah. I just was looking to that relaxation and time with my husband and finally doing something different. And it was great. Like we uh, had our wedding, we went to honeymoon to Mexico and maybe one month later, you know, after some time, I just started to feel some anxiety and worries and, you know, all this fear coming to me and becoming more intense because I just didn't know what to do next. Like I, I, <laughs> I spent all my time in the past skiing. Uh, I studied at university. I worked as a manager of sports team for one year, but I didn't have a lot of experience in living in real world. You know, <laughs> had a lot of experience living in an athlete and then it was so stressful. I, I had no idea who I was without sport anymore. I had no idea what to do next, what I wanted to do, what you know, what are my values right now without sport. <laughs> yeah, it was just very stressful time in this sense. So interesting. And so was that really your first experience feeling that kind of anxiety? It wasn't an issue that you had experienced as you were competing before then? I experienced anxiety before too. And I'm naturally a very anxious person, I can say. And that type of anxiety during competition, it was a little bit different because there was a goal and there was a clear path how to you know, achieve that goal, or at least I knew what I had to do to come there. But <laughs> with my new life, I didn't have coaches. <laughs> I didn't have training plans prepared for me. I didn't know what steps to take to, you know, to discover myself, to find what I like to do, to find my destiny, new purpose and meaning in life. And also before in my life, I try to leave sport for a few times before and it wasn't successful every time I came back because I just was craving sport so much and life without sport was so stressful so I knew that that nostalgia and that it, it will come to me and it definitely did I remember waking up in the morning and just after having this dream about skiing and I thought oh maybe it's not too late to come back maybe I still have chance you know I'm not so old still I, I still can come back <laughs> yeah and I think that's I think that's really interesting because I've heard for years you know that um athletes although I've I've never been one myself. I've always been a bit athletically challenged, <laughs> more of an indoor um, activities sort of a person. 
But what we hear is that the way athletes come through their nerves or they get themselves in that zone for peak performance is that training. And then you can just click into gear, so to speak, and go on your instincts and you know exactly what to do. You've rehearsed it in your mind. Your body has that memory and you just perform. And, and one thing that this is making me think of too is, um, you know, a lot of people think, you know, talking about stress, our ideal is to have zero stress, which is absolutely impossible. But that zone of performance, when workers are in that zone and time falls away, or when athletes just hit that stride and perform at their absolute peak, that comes from a state of stress. So you're skills that you build over that time to turn that stress into your optimal performance, just kind of, you know, clicks again in my mind, like exemplifies how we can use stress to enhance our performance or to leverage our success. And it doesn't always seem logical, but training and recognizing how that comes together makes that a little easier to, to trust that it's going to carry mm -hmm. you through. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And like, we don't, we cannot avoid stress in our lives. So stress can be very helpful too when there is a competition and I'm nervous a little bit and excited at the same time, it can give me this strength and just adrenaline, you know, <laughs> to keep going, uh, give me endurance to just, with, you know, withstand all this long day of being on skis and competing. So it's, it can be helpful, but I think it's how we approach stress can make a big difference like what is our attitude i i know from my own experience that sometimes i don't handle stress very well it's just because of my attitude it's just because how i um you know think about this particular situation or think and how i behave and respond to that that yeah can be not very helpful Yes. And, and it's something we have to keep coming back to, you know, once we have that awareness or we understand, you know, that's one part of it. And then the practice and gaining that faith that we can work through it and see the results that we want on the other side. It, it, it comes over time. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, as you were going through this period of trying to decide what would call to you next? And you mentioned having that dream and, and waking up. Was that kind of an aha moment? Did it come to you in a spark of recognition or was it something that just became more clear or you recognized this is something that you've experienced and you can speak to others? Yeah, it was a gradual, gradual path for me to just to realize what I want to do next. I started to be looking inside myself and I started to work with counselors and coaches and I had support from my husband and my friends too and then just gradually started to discover who I was beyond my career who I was you know, beyond being an athlete and what I liked to do started to try to remember what, <laughs> what my other passions and hobbies were before, like or during sport, you know. Um, and when I was an athlete, I just didn't have time, not necessary to do everything I liked doing. Yeah, so started this exploration process with help uh, of other people. And gradually talking to with other people, I realized that it's not only me who faces challenges, other people face these challenges during life transitions as well. And that is why I just want to help other people to go through these transitions smoothly and with less stress, with less overwhelm. Yes, and I think that recognition that you came to and it's, it's easy to see, you know, from a point of view where we see someone working through something, we can see, oh, they're going through this experience like someone else, or like we all do at this stage of our lives. Or of course, after a completely engaging and very demanding career, it would be natural to feel rudderless afterward. But when we're in that experience, we feel, we can feel like we're the only one 
who's having this experience. Like everyone else figured out what they want to do. Where, where's my spark of inspiration? What's, what's my problem? Right. And then we can start being hard on ourselves and kind of holding ourselves back because we're judging and not being open to or allowing the process. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, was one of the reasons I wanted to write my book it just because I wanted to share with people my experience so they can relate. And I tried to be as honest as I could, uh, of course, not disclosing like every personal detail of my life, but just sharing what I went through in my childhood, uh, during my sport career, uh, and then after retirement from professional sport and trying to find myself in new life. And, and, I was happy to hear that people actually could relate. And it's just a, such a good, great gift for me that people can find something that can help he, them to, you know, to feel better, to live more fulfilling life and know that they're not alone in this world. Exactly. Exactly. That we have, there's more that unites us than divides us. So it's, it's wonderful to get that affirmation. Like, oh, I'm, I'm just in this phase of my process and, it's like everyone else. We're all in different phases, but I tend to think we're ex in exactly the right place. You know, we're not late for anything. It's all unfolding mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. its own time. And so I love the title and I'm curious, my, my journey to boldness, my Russian way to boldness is, was that something that culturally was a little hard for you to step into? Is that, is boldness not recommended or encouraged in Russia? being American. I mean, I, there are stereotypes, but that's certainly not what we want to rely on. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's difficult for me to talk for everybody in Russia, because definitely people have different family background and experience in their life. For me, there was two reasons I wanted to name this book this way, just boldness, this, you know, play of this, or because I'm bold, I don't know if some not everybody can see me <laughs> <laughs> listening to podcasts so I'm bald because I have alopecia so um yeah one reason is just you know I came to being bald without hair and I lost my confidence at some point because of that but then I was able to be bald and have courage to go into the world uh after I shaved my head just to not to wear a wig and just be who I am in the world, like present with this appearance. So it was a big shift, like mindset shift for me. Uh, but also, of course, just growing up in Russia, I my my childhood was in you know 19s in Russia when the economic in Russia wasn't so strong and my parents struggled so much with earning money even though they had jobs. Yeah, it was very difficult time for my parents and uh, they struggled and my dad, he had some problems with alcohol. So it brought some stress to our family as well. Also, my dad was my coach. So we didn't have so much daddy and daughter time we were more like a athlete and a coach in that type of relationship but he was much more he had much more expectation for me than from other athletes of course <laughs> so it was stressful time for me to grow up and I didn't have this courage to be myself I wasn't bold enough to be myself because it's probably wasn't safe in that, in that time. You know, it was difficult to speak up, to show my feelings, to do something that was not expected from me. So I, I lost myself a little bit in that process. Yes, thank you. And I, I remember growing up in the 90s as well. And of course, it wasn't happening in my own backyard, but being aware of the change, the rapid state, I'm sure of change and, you know, that dissonance as, as things shift culturally or societally. So, and I didn't realize that your father was your coach, hence your very early start on the slope. So of course, you know, he always had an eye to where could she be going with this and how far can we take this? I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's totally true. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, 
as we were chatting just before we hopped on uh, for the program, I was sharing, I have a couple of friends with alopecia. And as you say, you know, the choice of will I wear a wig, um, which I think is a question of, of confidence or self-acceptance as well as how many times do I want to answer questions <laughs> if people are bold enough to ask you questions about it. And another friend who since... Um, her experience began with it. She has always just proudly been my now bald friend, Kelly, and she's, you know, holding her own. And, and actually now she um, designs fashions and patterns and, and really is stepping more into kind of a, a spotlight and really embracing her self-image. And I know that's been a process and it always is for all of us, you know, and we tend to be our own worst critic and think that the one thing that everyone notices about us is the one thing, you know, we, we magnify our own flaws. And so mm -hmm. I love that with the play on words in your book, you're speaking to how can I be bold and, you know, answer this unasked question or step into this new experience of, of baldness. Yeah, for me, it was about many things. I started to lose hair, like my lipisha started to progress in 2013. But before, it wasn't so strong. I think the first time I noticed alopecia, I was around 12 or 13 years old, but it just was a small patch on my neighbor area, you know, like it wasn't visible to other people so much. It was just accident why somebody noticed that. <laughs> uh, I even wasn't aware about its existence before. Um, yeah, and I... It, it, of course, brought some additional stress in my life because I never knew when my hair was going to fall out or where, in what parts and in what amount. So it was stressful, but it didn't force me to look at my, kind of to revise my attitude to my appearance till 2013 and later. But when my hair started to fall out, so fast and quickly I couldn't hide my bald spots anymore I had to face that choice like what to do next do I want to wear a wig which also an option and many people do that or do I want just shave my hair uh, hat and you know be like that in the world and I decided to shave my head just because I don't know it was less struggles, I guess. <laughs> and uh, it just was the way I wanted to go. But it was challenging because for me, my hair was also my connection to my femininity energy, feminine energy. And it was difficult to lose them. I was kind of, I was losing my myself as a woman. <laughs> and then I started to challenge my attitude, my perception on femininity, on appearance, and I realized that I had this very deep beliefs about appearance and how women should behave and how they should look like. Yeah, and it was interesting that I never kind of challenged them before so much. I was wondering about them. I was experimenting in my you know, early years and trying to uh, do makeup on my face and you know, follow some of these uh, social media images, but I didn't like that. Like I didn't have uh, enough patience and <laughs> desire to do makeup every day. So I, always stopped after one month of trying <laughs> and I didn't find it comfortable to wear like very high heels. So it was trying to find my way to relate to my appearance and the way I dressed and the way I present myself as a woman, for example. And yeah, it was hard, but I knew that my hair, like, I don't know, I just had this belief in my hair that woman Need, needs to have a long hair. <laughs> 
so I did. And then I started to lose them. And I was like, like, okay, now I have no idea like, <laughs> like how I can present myself. So yeah, it was a struggle. And it, and it seems like it came along at exactly the same point in time when you are also redefining yourself professionally or finding your next purpose or direction. And so that really loaded the situation, right? Because oh, even fundamentally, yeah. am I feminine? Am I a woman? You know, starting really from a blank slate at that point and, and questioning all of these definitions or concepts that we develop or pick up as we grow up and yeah. it was another another life another transition that I had to yeah overcome in my life uh, but I'm happy that I did the way I did it because right after I shaved my head I felt so much calmer and at peace with myself it was uh I was nervous to go to shopping mall at first time after I shaved, uh, shaved my head because I thought everybody was you know, going to look at me and <laughs> point and finger at me, but nobody did. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> so yeah, it was it was great experience. Well, and I think that says a lot too about, you know, we struggle so much with with coming to a decision, right? And we can put so much fear in what this choice is going to mean. Um, can I can I change my mind? If if I'm sorry about this, can I go back, right? Can I can I reclaim this? Can I reset the clock? And then once the decision was made, once you took action, then it was it was sounds like it was almost a load off. You know, just a relief. Yeah. Yeah, it was a huge relief for me. It was a huge relief that I can just be myself and I don't need to hide and, you know, <laughs> pretend that I don't have bald spots on my head <laughs> and worry about that, uh, that somebody could notice something was wrong. Um, yeah, and it's what I, what I learned from my experience and from some education too, is that we are much more than our body or our profession or some or our hobby or something else yeah we are much more um, than something that we do regularly and I encourage everybody just to look at themselves from this perspective to find um, who they are beyond their body or beyond their career it's amazing thing to to do and to think about it's not something we often think about i guess yeah but it's great exercise to do just to you know to ponder like who i am in this like broad concept because yeah i am bold but it's just one part of me there are so many other parts that i have yeah Yes, and I think that makes you um, even more tuned into the different ways in which we tend to struggle as we're going through life transitions because you've been able to walk through that process yourself. So where do you, are there, how do you help guide um, your clients through this process? I mean, it's hard to give ourselves that permission to take space and to really tune into that as something that you see them resist. Yeah, it's going to be very hard to, to find the space. You're right, because people usually experience a lot of anxiety and fears and all this just uncertainty makes them very like vulnerable you know and <laughs> feeling worry about the future and when we feel this anxiety and worries it's difficult to have space for ourselves like we can act from this place of anxiety instead of place of just calmness and, and uh, good understanding of what we want so if one of the things we work on just reducing that, that stress level, reducing that anxiety and worries, and just through different mindfulness exercises, self-awareness, just different techniques um, that people can utilize just to give themselves a space, even like 
mental space for themselves so they're not just always doing something they actually stop at least for you know a few minutes and think okay how I am right now like what happening to me what I experience like what touches me what resonates with me in today um, this is a very important part of uh, my work with people but also of course then we can explore how like what values people have right now because our values changes with us <laughs> and we need to revise them we need to understand what is important for me right now in my life at this stage and it become easier to uh, you know to understand what direction we want to go when we are clear about our values and then also we, of course, work on identity, trying to just explore um, what parts we lost a little bit or what parts of us kind of shrinken because we left the career or we divorced or we now you know, um, don't have kids in our house. So we kind of losing parts of ourselves in the past a little bit and we need to fill that void with something else we need to discover other parts of, of ourselves so it's not so stressful for us to live. And of course, another big question is about finding meaning in life. Um, sometimes it's also can be very challenging for people to understand, okay, like now what? Like I had that goal or I had that structure in my life. You know, my I wake up at 7 a.m. and I had my routine I went to uh, for like to my workplace I did all these activities and I had kids la 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 and now like <laughs> my day is empty how like <laughs> what is how can I feel this day to make it meaningful and um, find new purpose in my life so yeah it's another important thing that we do Yes. And, and you remind me again, I mean, this just keeps coming to my mind through the course of the conversation. So maybe I already said this, but I think it's, it's such a gift to, um, and certainly when you're working with a coach to have that help or the reminder to come back to what's true for you, because there's so much expectation from society, from family, from taking care of other people, that it's easy to just go along with that flow and fulfill that until something leads us to the next chapter. And then we've lost that compass, you know, that inner compass or true north that says, yeah, I feel like I'm on the right track because we've been satisfying things for so many other people for so long that tuning back into that message can be a bit of a journey or an awakening. Yeah, yeah. And another thing that is challenging, was challenging for me and challenging for other people is to let something go and accept that our time and energy is limited just to meet with this limitation we have in our daily life. Because sometimes, you know, yeah, we can have many values and we want to do so many things, but <laughs> we, in reality, we cannot so when we set priorities in our life, we just need to face our limitation and understand, okay, like I have only 24 hours in my day, like how can I want to spend this uh, time uh, <laughs> doing what, meeting with whom, yeah, and meeting with this like limitation, it can be so challenging, but it also can be very helpful, yeah, because it just, you know, give us, I, I have this, I, I heard this quote from one of education I took, and I just love it that existence doesn't mean doing everything, it just means doing something. And I just love it because it gives so much freedom in current, you know, society and situation when everybody expects from us, oh, many, you know, society expects, expects, from, expects from us doing so many things and being active and, you know, participating in different activities. And this phrase just at least gives me and to my clients and other people I share it with, 
some freedom and some relaxation, some relief that, oh, okay, I actually don't need to do so many things. I can just choose something that um, I value, something that is important for me, and I have energy and time for that. And it's okay to uh, just to do something, not everything, and it's easy to let something go. Yeah, in this sense. Yes. Yeah. I love that. And it, it reminds me too of that concept. I, I can't think of exactly the, the quote or, or the way to put it, but, you know, to make that shift from being a human doing yeah. back to being a human being. Oh, and I love it. Give yourself yeah. that space. Cause we, we do societally, there's this drive to always be checking things off the list or accomplishing things or striving towards a goal. And, and, and like I was saying, I think a lot of times we take on the goals or expectations from other people and put those at the top of our list. And, and then we tend to fall off of the list, our own well-being or balance or value, you know, self-care, certainly who has time for that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that can be, that can be tricky. So I'd love to know um, for yourself, what are some ways that you have found to support your own resilience? Yeah, thank you for asking, because it was uh, quite a process for me to find what um, helps me to be resilient. Uh, one of the things is self-care. It's a huge, huge aspect. And again, I was uh, I spend I spent some time on understanding what is it for me, because I discovered self-care for me is not you know going and buying something for me, doing something like you know going to massage. It can be part. I love massage <laughs> therapy, uh, but in broader aspect, self-care for me is just about being compassion to myself and listen to myself, listen to my body and yeah, to what resonates with me during the day. Just again, giving myself the space and time to actually turn inwards and see what is happening inside me, not only outside me. And again, uh, to see inside me without judgment, or just with compassion, like I would do with a best friend, just like having this inner dialogue when I ask and I listen <laughs> to what comes in. I not just, you know, talk and say like, oh, you, you need to do that or you should do that or like, um, yeah, actually having this opportunity for an inner dialogue when I just listening and understanding what is you know what is happening right now for me and it was helpful on so many levels on my physical health because I used to have migraines and I didn't listen to my body I totally ignore all the signals I pushed myself you know I didn't want to accept my limitations I just no no I can't do it you know (laughs) and then my body gave up and I had like this severe migraines for a few days when I just couldn't eat uh walk nothing I just could lie down and on my bed in dark rooms that's all and it was awful experience um and then I I I gradually started to listen to my physical body uh, but also I started to listen to you know to my emotional experiences and kind of recognizing okay what is happening I'm frustrated right now okay why like what can I do about that and um Another aspect of self-care, it's um, or just of resilience in general, is this emotional intelligence. When I do not suppress my negative, unpleasant feelings, but I try to let them be and just listen what they're trying to say to me, because I believe our emotions they just signal that. Uh, try to show that something is going on around us. If we, if we have experience positive feelings, everything is great. We can just you know, keep going with what we are doing. But if we experience some unpleasant feelings, it means that 
something just requires our attention. So, you know, like I, I was changing this attitude to my emotional state, to learning how to tolerate my intense feelings and be with them and just, yeah, make my, um, it made me much more resilient for sure. I love that. And I think in all of those different aspects of, of growing your awareness and tuning in, I think that what you said about treating yourself like you would a good friend, like speaks to all of those. That's mm -hmm. such a powerful reminder. Sometimes we say things to ourselves or we hold ourselves to standards that we would never hold anyone else to. We would never tell our best friend, I can't believe you're going to take a day off because you have a migraine. You'd be like, yeah. can I bring you chicken soup? Is there anything I can do? Right. But we yeah. don't give ourselves that kind of nurturing until we make that switch, until we give ourselves permission to say, oh, let's let ourselves off the hook a little bit. Let's, let's be a little more supportive of ourselves and give ourselves permission to, uh, to take what we need to do what restores us. And, and to your point too, thank you for pointing out that self-care looks different for everybody. I think that, you know, people look at going for a spa day or, you know, whatever trappings self-care has taken on because it's become such a marketable concept. Like, well, that doesn't appeal to me. So I don't need self-care, but giving mm -hmm. yourself that space to tune in and say, oh, this makes me feel restored. This gives me energy. This brings me back to balance after a bad day at work or whatever's come up. That's what self-care is. We all get to define our own. Yeah, and self-care can be also about uh, protecting our boundaries or speaking, you know, up. Yeah, it's another, like, it took me months, actually, to talk to my husband and ask him to wrap up this piece of trees in the fridge so it doesn't, you know, dry it out. <laughs> <laughs> it was a huge self-care step for me, but it was challenging to do. <laughs> and I don't know why. <laughs> It's it's just funny that it's something sim I I just wanted to share the story because it's something that seems so simple but it still can be very challenging and <laughs> right so, every time you yeah. go to the refrigerator and you see the block of cheese you're yeah, getting should, angry but he has yeah. no idea why suddenly you're in a bad mood because you're like well pff, he should know <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> once that conversation is had it's a world of difference yeah. I love that. I, thank you so much. This has been a phenomenal conversation. I would love for you to share with our audience how they can learn more about you or find out how to work with you if they're in the midst of a transition and just really resonating with your message. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for asking this. And uh, I will provide link to Susie so Susie can share some links for free gifts where you can learn even more about how to be resilient and also, I offer just 30 minutes initial consultation. So just again, go to the link to my website and book this time with me. I will be so thrilled to talk to you and help you in your life. Beautiful. We'll have those links in the show notes. So they're super easy to find and folks can connect with you. And I think we've had a, a terrific conversation. Thanks for bringing some inspiration and, and grounding and giving per people permission to, to make a little space to explore yeah. what resonates. Thank you so much, so much, Susie. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. I'm, I'm so glad. Have a wonderful day. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for tuning in today. Check out the show notes for any links we mentioned. To learn more about living life with less stress and more flow, visit happifiedlife.com. And if you found value in today's episode, make sure you subscribe to catch the next one and leave a review to help fellow pod surfers find Happified. Until next time, keep on shining. <laughs>